late, but I think we should get started so that way we don't delay the, uh, the next uh, sessions we have coming up. So um, thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to the Renewable Integration Session. My name is Julian Lamy. I'm a PhD candidate at Carnegie Mellon University in Engineering and Public Policy. I spent the past four years studying the economics of wind power, and before that worked for several years as a consultant. Um, I've also helped run the local chapter here um, in Pittsburgh for USAE, and we're delighted to have the national conference here, so thank you all for coming. Um, it's with great pleasure that I introduce this very distinguished panel on renewable energy integration. Uh, we have panelists from academia, grid operations, and the renewables industry um, who will shed light on the challenges and solutions uh, to integrating renewable energy into our electricity grid and ultimately into our economy. Before I introduce our panel, let me just first explain the session logistics. First, I'll introduce the panelists. Then each one will present for a maximum of 10 minutes. Um, each presentation will be followed by five minutes of questions. So if you want to ask the panelists a question about the presentation, that's the time to do it. Um, after all presentations, we'll then have 20 to 30 minutes for a panel discussion. I'll kick it off with a couple questions. Um, and then after that, we'll open up to the audience. Sound good? OK, let's get started. Um, so first up, we have Jay Apps who is professor at Carnegie Mellon University's Tepper School of Business in the Department of Engineering and Public Policy. He is the co-director of the Carnegie Mellon Electricity Industry Center and director of the Renew Electric Project. He has co-authored approximately 100 papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals, as well as two books and several book chapters. He has published op-ed pieces in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and the Washington Post. Professor Aft received an AB in Physics from Harvard College in 1971 and PhD in Physics from MIT in 1976. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He received the NASA Distinguished Service Medal in 1997 and the Metcalf Life Achievement Award for significant contributions to engineering in 2002. Thank you for being with us, Shay. Uh, Resmi, next on our panel is Resmi Surendra, who is the Senior Manager of Market Anal Analysis and Design at ERCOT, where she is responsible for monitoring CRR markets and analyzing real-time and day-ahead market prices. She also worked in ERCOT's operations planning group, where she was responsible for supporting network applications, conducting reliability studies, and coordinating operations. She received her bachelor's in electrical engineering from University of Kerala, India, and her master's in electrical and computer engineering from University of Texas at Austin. Thanks for being our guest. Um, next, we have Severin Bornstein, who is E.T. Grether Professor of Business Administration and Public Policy at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley and a research associate of Energy Institute at Haas. He is also Director Emeritus of the University of California and Ener uh, California Energy Institute and uh, the Energy Institute at Haas. He received th his AB from UC Berkeley and PhD in economics from MIT. His research focuses on business competition, strategy, and regulation. He has published extensively on the airline industry, the oil and gasoline industries, and electricity markets. Thank you for being on our panel. And lastly, we, on our panel, we have Mike Spearschneider, who is the Chief Permitting and Public Policy Officer at Everpower, um, a developer, owner, and operator of wind farms based here in Pittsburgh. He oversees all permitting, permitting and government affairs activities for Everpower, focusing on the many and nuanced overlap between the two disciplines. <coughs> Before Everpower, he worked as an analyst for natural gas markets at Cambridge Energy Research Associates. He graduated from the University of Pittsburgh with a BS in physics, and BA in Environmental Studies, and received an MS in Technology and Policy and Material Science and Engineering from MIT. Uh, thanks, Mike, for being on our panel. So welcome, all of you. Thank you very much for being here. Um, and please join me in welcoming our panelists. So first up, we have uh, Jay Haft. Thanks, Julian. Uh, what I'm uh, I'm going to wake you up. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'll get out a, a, a timer here. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is to uh, tell you a little bit about some of the physics and the economics that that implies for integration primarily of wind, although I'll spend a moment or two uh, on solar in the grid. Um, this is the work of a large number of people, one or two of whom are in the audience that were part of uh, our renewal project that ran over about four years and resulted uh, in a book. That's the bad news, there's a book. The good news is that there's a bunch of uh, PhD students who are now out in the real world. All right, so what 
are the kinds of things that we can learn from the variability of wind, and then I'll talk to you about solar too. We know that they're both uh, variable. That in the green is uh, a year's worth of ERCOT wind, last year as a matter of fact, and on the right is a day worth of solar PV. Right? There's large and deep fluctuations at both the time scales. Okay? The important thing to know about this, this economically incredibly important, is that it's not white noise. White noise means it's the same amplitude at all frequencies. But right? if wind or solar were white noise, the same at all frequencies, we couldn't afford to integrate either of them. Nature is much kinder than that. It turns out the fluctuations are a factor of 30 stronger at low frequencies, like a day, 12 hours, economic dispatch time scales, slow enough that a coal plant can ramp up and down fast enough to follow the fluctuation, than they are at hourly time scales, certainly minute time scales. That is a piece of physics that we should be eternally grateful for, right? or at least as grateful until the sun stops and the wind stops blowing. Okay. So let me tell you something about the mathematical character of those fluctuations. I promise there's not an equation in this whole talk. It's all right. It's after lunch. I know that. But I will show you something that most of you have in your pocket, an equalizer from an iPad, right? On the low frequency notes, that's on the left. On the high frequency notes, that's on the right. So what I'm going to show you is a power spectrum of wind and then uh, Kelly Kleiman's work on solar will be discussed tomorrow. I'll show you a little bit of that uh, today. It turns out when you take those time series of wind or solar and you transform them into what are the low notes and the high notes, the low frequencies and the high frequencies by Fourier transforming, you get a power spectrum that looks like this. Now, this is very interesting because I, let's see here, let's see if I can get a, yeah, there we are. All right, so this is a couple of days, here's a day or so, and this is down at 30 seconds. Down here, the wind turbine can't respond fast enough to show the real physical character of what's going on in the atmosphere. But here, you see these two spikes are due to the blades passing the tower at the wind turbine. Okay? That's interesting, but not useful. What's useful is this regime in here, where you can see that the fluctuations are much weaker, much weaker, at high frequencies. Well, not my computer. At high frequencies than they are at low frequencies. That is what makes it possible to integrate wind and solar. But we can learn more about integration of wind and solar than just that qualitative but interesting piece. If we look at the power spectrum from, let's say, one wind plant, we see something. If we look at the power spectrum from many wind plants together, we see something different. And I'm going to show you that. Here's the 20 largest wind plants in Texas. Sorry for the contrast on that one. It's a little better over here. Uh, but they're, they're spread out over um, not quite a 1,000 kilometers or so. When I look at the power spectrum from one wind plant, it looks like this. Nice spectral fall off at a frequency that's, uh, again, interesting. Um, you're an economist. I think that's going to take a janitor. <laughs> but you're making it work. Thank you. Well done. That's right. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So when you take a look at one uh, wind plant, this is what you get. Let's suppose that I add a few wind plants together in the computer or physically. If I add four wind plants together, notice what happens. That's the green as opposed to the black. At a day, 12 hours, nothing much happens. But you do get smoothing from adding those wind plants together at high frequencies. Right? This is on the right side of that scale. This is 15 minutes or so over there. And I get almost an order of magnitude in one scale in power spectral density, about a factor of three in power, as an electrical engineer would call it. 
Uh, but I get that only at the very highest frequencies. Now look what happens when I add all 20 plants together. I get about the same amount of additional smoothing that I get from adding four plants together to one. An economist will tell you that means diminishing returns. Okay? The other thing that you should get out of this is that smoothing by geographic diversity not only has diminishing returns, but also has very different character at very different time scales. The time scale at which you talk about smoothing is really, really important. 12 hours has much less smoothing uh, than an hour. Okay? And the other is that smoothing has very quickly diminishing returns. The top uh, curve, the blue curve on there, for those of you who can see in color, is uh, at 12 hours. And I only smooth about half the fluctuations, no matter how many wind plants I have together at 12 hours. But at one hour, I can smooth 95% of the fluctuations out. That makes a very, very big difference. And it's something that is, is both quantitatively and qualitatively interesting to know. Okay. Now let's move quickly to solar. Here's one solar array, big, uh, what was then the largest solar array in the country. Here's the very next day, clouds. The publicity picture, you notice there's clouds in it. right? And here are some of these fast and deep fluctuations. So. Uh, Kelly Klima's work is going to be discussed tomorrow at 8.30 a.m., have your coffee, uh, and come in this very room, I think, at 8.30 in the morning, and uh, we'll talk about geographic smoothing of PV. But back to wind. Can you just cover the country with copper? There was a Scientific American article a few years ago that said if you did all the fluctuations, would just smooth right out. Not so fast. I'm going to show you the slope of those curves if you add them together uh, in Bonneville, Kaizo, ERCOT, uh, Mid-Continent ISO, and all four of them added together, and you just don't see much improvement when you add all four of them together. There are some interesting theoretical reasons that my colleague Mahesh Bandy uh, has been looking at, and what Mahesh has found is that for basic physics reasons, there is a very serious limit to the amount of geographic smoothing that you can get for wind power. That means that even continent scale grids are going to have to have a fair amount of dispatchable generation to integrate uh, wind. Um, let me just in the remaining couple of minutes talk a little bit about some other pieces. Uh, my former PhD student uh, looked at forecasts of wind power and found that every one of the three companies from which we got uh, data had a systemic error. Forecasts were above actual generation when they forecasted a lot of wind and below when they forecasted a little bit of wind. We well, understand that, but that's not interesting for this talk. Uh, but Brandon then said, all right, given an amount of required reserve generation, ERCOT requires 95% of the day hit forecast errors, how much additional generation do you need? Well, there's actually a peak to this curve which nobody wanted to keep the job would, uh, would honor, but it goes up and up and up as you have more uh, wind power forecasts and you need you know, a few gigawatts extra. And so we can do these calculations now for mid-continent ISO and for ERCOT. Uh, MISO, you need a little less reserves than for ERCOT because it's bigger and you do get a little bit more geographic smoothing. But we can now say that the folks that say, well, as you get more and more wind, you need in uh, a lot more reserves, or you need no more reserves, or both wrong. It increases linearly. And what we see is that, say, a 20% wind, you need uh, about, say, 5% or 8%, depending on where you are, uh, more reserves. It's not awful to integrate wind. And come tomorrow morning, you'll hear about solar. So again, thank you to the folks who did the work. Uh, and Julian, let me turn it back to you. Yes. So on the right, I'm a PhD in chemical Hi, Wade. Uh, 
Yeah, and I think I'll repeat a little bit of that. What's the optimal grid size for integrated wind? That plays with some work that was done starting in the early 1960s and then dropped, which is for reliability. What's the optimal size of the grid? You want it bigger than a city so that you can bring in generation, but you don't want it so big that when the grid collapses, all of the Eastern Interconnect goes down. And there is some serious work by very good electrical engineers that was done in the late 60s that said, basically, our grids have grown a bit too big at the moment. So I think that uh, your question will probably be determined more by reliability than by smoothing. I put away my timer. Have we got time for a couple more? Panelists are okay, too. You folks actually know something. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have much data on that. The question is, does, is the character of adding large and small distributed solar different? The solar folks are really shy about giving up their data. You'll see tomorrow that we have data from 50 uh, utility-scale solar plants. That's the good news. The bad news is we have to go to India to get it. Um, and I know that EPRI has some data on little monitors, not really rooftop generation, and there's a little bit of data from things like the Pecan Street project. But I think that it's going to take another three years to get the data uh, so that people can answer that question. Okay, my second question is, uh, for, 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 for the electricity grid, this is just a, a, a power curve. How about No data. Don't know. Good question. Uh, excellent question for your first PhD student when you get a faculty job. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Julian, for having me here. Um, I'll give a quick summary of ERCOD, the wind pattern in ERCOD, and some of the challenges and market design changes that we have done to incorporate wind. So um, ERCOD, some of you don't know it, it's the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. It's the ISO RTO of the Texas region. And the others who know know that it's quite different from all the other ISOs in that it's an isolated system. It's not under FERC. That makes a big difference for us. Uh, it's an energy-only market with very high system-wide offer cap. It has a very good retail competition, which means that we don't, it's really hard for investors to get power purchase agreement. Um, most of our generation mix is natural gas, which means that our prices are fluctuating based on the natural gas prices. Our load is more than 50% residential air conditioning, which means that most of the time our load is very low, and during summer peak it goes super high. And that means that our prices are relatively low most of the time, about $25, $30 average. And then it goes super high. Like uh, this summer in August, our prices in the head market have gone to $2,250. And on top of that, we have very high penetration of wind, which drives the prices negative sometimes. So all these factors that like having no power purchase agreement and um, a very low price and then negative prices makes it really hard for investors to get money in aircraft. And that makes resource adequacy a great concern for us. 
and we have been doing all sort of design and design changes to encourage all new generators, so wind is also welcome uh, to come to ERCOT. And wind has come to ERCOT. We have had tremendous growth of wind in ERCOT in the last 10 years. We had a renewable portfolio standard requirement of 2,000 megawatts by 2010, which we achieved in 2005. Uh, 10,000 megawatts by 2025, that we achieved by 2012. And right now, our wind install capacity is more than 13,000 megawatts. And we have, by the end of the year, most likely more than 16,000 megawatts of wind. And now that the PTC is kind of expired, a lot of wind has started to come in for 2017. And for 2017, we are predicting 25 gigawatts, 25,000 megawatts of wind in our system. Um, right now, wind is about 14% uh, by capacity and 10% by energy. And we had a peak like last week, more than 12,000 megawatts of wind. And that's during the night, which was about 36 percentage of our, of our capacity, so penetration was about 36 percentage, and we have seen penetration up to 40 percent in our system. <laughs> and we have done a lot of changes, market design changes, operational procedure changes, operational tools, and wrote a lot of rules for the wind to efficiently utilize all the wind and maintain the reliability of the system. So this is a typical wind pattern and load pattern in AirPod. The wind is the green line. And you can see that we get a lot of wind, but not when we really need it. Our wind is really high in the night. and our load peaks in the afternoon about 4 to 5 uh, p.m. And by that time, there is hardly any wind. We have recently got some wind generation in the coastal region, but that's quite uh, less amount compared to the wind that we have in the western region. The coastal wind is coincident with the, with the load. So that's why you get to see this uh, 2,000 megawatts here. Now, when we came, it came really fast. And it all came in the area where there is the maximum wind production. And maximum wind production was all in West, West Texas region. And there is not much load in that West Texas region, and there is not much network connecting the West Texas to the rest of the area. So when we came, we had to tell that you have to be curtailed. So there is no standard like California where we have to take it. We have to curtail it, otherwise we'll have transition problems and condition problems. So we had to agree, and there had been lots of discussion about who will get curtailed first and all, but then they all agreed that we need to be curtailed. So then we started doing condition management for wind. Once we started condition management, we started seeing more problems. When we curtail them, they would suddenly drop. And then the frequency would go really low. And then when we release them, they would go super high. And then the frequency will go super high. So we started seeing frequency problems. Then we implemented ramp limit for wind resources so that they cannot go super fast whenever we are releasing them or whenever we are curtailing them. And then we started seeing more wind and more problems. We started seeing more variability in real time, and which required us to get more regulation. So we had to rethink how we procure our ancillary service the variability of wind in real time 
um, were addressed by regulation. So instead of looking at just the load variation, we started looking at net load variation. And then we also started looking at net load forecast error instead of load forecast error for non-spin procurement. And the main thing that helped us was starting to run our real-time market right now for the next five minutes based on the current wind production. So we are not using any wind forecast in our real-time market. We are using it what is the current wind production, and we are dispatching it for the next five minutes. And we require the wind resources to submit energy offers into our real-time market. And if they don't submit an energy offer, we will create an energy offer for them. And then we dispatch those wind resources. And if they don't follow the dispatch, if we dispatch it to a level and they deviate more than 10% above that level, then they get a penalty for deviation. Then we put in these ramp limits. We put in phase shift optimization. We put in basically from an operational perspective, almost all the same requirement for wind resources like a conventional generator, like a primary frequency response, uh, voltage right through, um, reactive power requirement, all those requirements. And all these really helped us efficiently manage wind, utilize all the wind that is coming, and at the same time maintain reliability even with this 40% penetration of wind. That's all I have. Okay, so again, we can do a couple questions. Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Raul, and PhD student at Bikes University. I just want to ask you about. Oh, sorry, I'm back. So um, I want to ask you about, you said that there is a huge increase in wind in last years in the airport. I want to ask you, to what extent do you think is caused by the, the, the subsidies uh, that are provided? Do you hear me? Um, and the second question is, given this pattern that you show, <coughs> do you expect that the airport will be dominated by natural gas uh, generation in maybe five years? Okay. Can you repeat the first question again? Sorry. The first question is to what extent do you think that the increase in wind capacity was caused by uh, the subsidies in the, the, that are currently in the market? Okay. So we have always had lots of wind in our interconnection study requirement. I think in 2008 we have had about 50 gigawatts of wind in our study, but it just comes and goes and you don't know how much wind will really build. Uh, so in our future studies, we didn't see this big of a change by 2017, and that we started seeing after the PTC was, like, they expired the PTC, so the requirement is that you need to have a build by 20, before 2017, so that created the big jump, in my opinion. Um, the second question was natural gas. Yes, yeah, so given these patterns that I show about the market, my my prediction is that base loads base load will be displaced, right? Because you have shut down costs, and then uh -huh. you know, you, and then this creates also the negative pricing air cut. Uh -huh. So, do you think in five years we we will see a air cut dominated by natural gas with, uh, generation? Yeah, that's an interesting observation, and I think still needs to be seen how it will all play out. With the uh, clean power plant, you know you don't know what type of generation will come. It all depends on what's the state mandate, whether the BTC, ITC will extend, whether the solar uh, capital for solar will keep on reducing like this, and what is the cost of the natural gas price, right? Uh, in in our system, because it's an energy only market, and we do see ramp. Most of our nat our generation mix had kind of changed to natural gas already. We our gas uh, our generation mix is already 50% natural gas. Now with more wind, 
what we are seeing is in the night system wide the prices are becoming negative which is causing the coal units to operate at LSL they are operating at loss and we have even seen them offering negative prices to stay on so we'll have to wait and see if the CPP and all those will cause the coal to go out <coughs> and then probably peakers will come because you definitely need that capacity for the afternoon peak so it's not like all the units will go away and it will be renewable it has to be the natural gas or So uh, airport is an independent system operator. We create all sorts of facilities and products for market to develop in airport. And we have uh, actually started looking at re-evaluating our ancillary service products to incentivize storage and that kind of resources coming in. But we don't buy the products. Uh, we don't buy the yes, the units. I'm going to change the direction a little bit and talk about distributed generation, integrating distributed generation. And I'm also going to change the direction a little bit and focus entirely on economics. Well, with a couple of nods to the engineering um, because that's what I know something about and they actually speak, so that's where I'm going. Um, but to do that, I'm going to first take you back. Uh, there we go. Um, to restructuring of electricity markets because it turns out to be directly relevant. And Jim Bushnell and I finished a paper that was published in the Annual Review of Economics this year on this topic that looked at what happened, what drove electricity restructuring and how that's now applying to distributed generation. And the basic idea is back in the 1990s, there was very low marginal cost because of a lot of investment and capacity. Uh, but relatively high average cost because somebody had to pay for all that capacity. Regulated rates collect average cost, but wholesale prices reflect marginal cost. So marginal cost was well below average, which gave anyone who could buy on the wholesale market an interest in doing that. And sure enough, most of the large industrial customers in states that had high prices, like California, lobbied hard for restructuring in order to get access to those low marginal prices. We point out that really has nothing to do with efficiency, that just has to do with rent shifting. There are also efficiency arguments about restructuring, but the real political driver was the rent transfer possibility. Um, and we point out that in the 2000s, that shifted, went the opposite direction, and there's a wonderful series of stories uh, by a journalist in the New York Times doing investigative reporting showing us that deregulation has failed because deregulation deregulated states can have high prices, but all that had happened is marginal cost and average cost had shifted by then, so marginal cost was above average cost. And then we show that in more recent years it shifted back again, and marginal cost is now somewhat below average cost, and deregulation is a massive success once again. Um, and that was this huge threat to uh, the threat to uh, utilities, and now the new threat to utilities is distributed generation. And in large part, that's for the same reason, because average cost is increasingly higher than marginal cost again. In part, that's because of the expansion of grid renewables. Grid-level renewables have very low marginal cost, essentially zero when they're operating, but have very significant average cost because you still need to pay for all that uh, investment. So what we're seeing is, a, once again, a separation of average and marginal cost. But now, instead of accessing the market, Many customers want to self-generate. But you have exactly the same concern about inefficient bypass, that was the term back in the 1990s, uh, that you had back then, which is that this is not actually about efficiency, it's actually just about rent transfer. 
numbers. That is, it's about average cost being well above marginal cost. I don't want to pay my share of the average cost, so I go out and do something else. And as long as I can beat average cost, it's privately profitable. But if actually my, the cost of me doing something else is above the system marginal cost, I'm actually not saving society money. I'm just transferring rents. And that's largely what's happening now with, so, with distributed solar. Distributed solar is still more expensive than grid-scale solar. And I'm going to get to it has advantages and disadvantages, and we need more analysis of that. But it, it sure looks like right now it's more expensive. And there's a huge push uh, for, to, for distributed solar. A lot of this, again, has nothing to do with efficiency. Uh, a lot of the attraction is essentially I can beat my retail rates. Nowhere is this a bigger deal than in California, partially because California is the biggest solar market, and partially because California has the most ridiculous residential retail rates. We have increasing block rates that go up as you consume more that are not uh, actually adjusted for anything other than the broad region you live in. So the number of people, for instance, who live in the house is not a factor. Uh, and if you get up to the top tier, these days you're paying about 37 cents per kilowatt hour. And if you're on the bottom tier, you're paying about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. And there's no difference in the cost of those kilowatt hours. So you're not, you won't be surprised to hear that it's the people at the top tier who are installing solar. That leads to these sorts of articles, downgrading electric utilities, solar competition is, quote, viable, and it is if you continue bad regulation because solar competition, solar DG competition uh, at the residential scale is made viable by this, this set of regulation that is charging marginal prices that are well above marginal cost, and that that's a big factor in driving the distributed solar issue. So what's happened since 2000? Um, we've seen this large expansion of grid-scale renewables, as I talked about, a rapid growth uh, in some states, California being the leader in distributed generation, which right now still means solar rooftops. Um, Large-scale de deployment of smart meters at the same time, particularly since the um, stimulus package paid for many of them in 2009 and 10. Amazing advancements in develop and development in a uh, home automation <coughs> system. A lot of the same technology that is making solar so cheap is also making lots of other technologies cheap that actually can either substitute for or uh, complement solar, including improved sensors and switching and computational capabilities that can be used at the grid scale, but also can be used within the house to change the way we consume energy in the house. And what Jim and I talk about in our paper is that there are two pathways this can lead to. And we are right now at this fork and have to make a decision. And we're making different decisions in different locations. Path one we see is that this, techno this fabulous technology from solar to sensors to smart meters is used to tightly integrate individual energy users with the regional grid. You get two-way communications between users and wholesale markets, massively distributed responses to changes in wholesale conditions so that the market actually sends out signals about whether we're short or long in different locations, and computers, not people, automatically respond to those things. And we use all this great technology to maximize utilization of all of the resources, including energy efficiency and demand response. Path two, uh, the dark path, I would call it, is that all of this technology gets used to arbitrage price differences that don't reflect cost differences. That storage and distributed generation technologies about, allow for virtual cord cutting, not real cord cutting, but people thinking I'm producing my own energy when in fact they are constantly exporting and importing electricity with the grid. And the formation of micro grids that creates pockets of self-sustaining but isolated networks in some cases. But mostly that allows them to take advantage of these deviations. These pricing deviations, just to take you back, really didn't matter in the 1980s and 90s. A regulator's uh, responsibility was simply to figure out whose ox got bored when we had to collect the revenue. But when you got prices, quote, wrong, there wasn't much consumers could do about it. 
So it was just a matter of collecting more revenue and somebody being angry about it. And that's just not true anymore. There are a lot more options. And so technology is giving customers the ability to exit in ways they didn't have before. And as a result, the technology can be used to really arbitrage inefficient, or what I've recently called sloppy, rate making. Rate making is going to influence the pathway. Rate design can provide the right incentives by sending good price signals, or it can provide the wrong incentives by continuing to simply allocate the sunk costs in ways that we think may be fair, but encourage people to behave inefficiently. And that's very reminiscent of retail choice. So what are the benefits and costs? I'm going to just list these quickly because I have one more point to make and I have one more minute. Um, greater spatial diversification, reduced line losses, of course, when you produce at the end use, delayed distribution upgrade costs, which turn out to be very small, reduced transmission costs. The real estate is free, and that is a big deal when you talk to grid-scale solar developers. Um, resilience with batteries, and if you put batteries in smart inverters, those are all advantages of distributed solar. But higher cost of low-scale deployment is the big elephant. Overcoming that is tough. <coughs> Uh, non-optimized deployment, non-controllable and curtailable uh, reverse flow. So let me make one last point. People then talk about, well, where do we get the revenues from? The utilities then say, well, everything's a fixed cost, and so we should just have big fixed charges. Utilities really don't understand what fixed costs are. They start telling us that generation is a fixed cost, generation capacity, when it's clearly marginal in any serious time frame. Um, on the other hand, there are customer advocates who say nothing's a fixed cost, when in fact there are customer-specific fixed costs. Customer-specific fixed costs, there's actually good economics about uh, charging those as customer-specific fixed charges. The idea that other stuff should be recovered from fixed costs, there's actually no economics behind that. We have a revenue shortfall. There is no economic uh, guidance to how to collect that, because if the prices were already reflecting true costs, then it's a matter of what's the distortion. The distortion used to be, well, if you use a fixed cost, nobody can do anything about it. That's just not true anymore, and you, there's more possibility for exit. And so there are a balancing of inefficiencies as well as the distributional considerations. So not everyone agrees. This is a great quote. I won't have time to let you read, but it basically says that we shouldn't have fixed charges because that's going to force people to rather than producing their own energy, to depend on dirty grid power. Um, the phrase dirty grid power is the preferred phrase if you're distributed uh, renewables uh, producer. Thank you very much. They say I have to stay up here for questions. I was just curious, since you mentioned the uh, rate making structure in the uh, California market, you might speak to uh, some of the other rate devices with respect to electric vehicle adoption um, as well, and, and what, what you think about that in relation to this. Oh, thank you. I didn't plant this question. Um, <laughs> one, of, one, of the, one of the great things about talk, talking to people about uh, rate making and fairness and encouraging energy efficiency through 30 cent per kilowatt hour uh, rates is then you say, well, isn't that a problem for electric vehicles? And then they have to say, well, of course, we wouldn't want to charge electric vehicles that because that's a good energy use. So we're going to go into your home and figure out which are your good energy uses and which are your bad energy uses. Um, Michael Pollan is a food writer who is in many ways a wonderful man and a great writer. But at the end of his probably most famous book, the Omnivore's Dilemma, he talks about this wonderful scene where people are going out to the farm where their chicken is grown, one by one, to pick up their chicken so that they know the full farm-to-table line. And, they, and he doesn't seem to realize that there are other sustainability issues that raises. When I go to the store, I don't want to have to think about every product. Am I, is this, like, what are all the other costs? I want those priced in there because I'm not going to know. And that's what we have to do. We have to set rates that actually price in environmental externalities and local, ex and local uh, grid constraints and so forth. That's where we start. When we do that, we're going to find out we collect a lot of the revenue we can need. 
we're still going to have a shortfall. Then we're going to have to fight and worry about how do we collect that shortfall. Is it best done through fixed customer charges? Is it best done through some other distortions? But California is just massively far from that, that if we could just get there, it would be a huge welfare improvement. Many other states are closer, but still have a long ways to go to get rates that come close to reflecting the true cost. But I really believe that if we don't do that, we're just constantly fighting against ourselves in trying to figure out and trying to get people to follow the right uh, path. Okay. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, so, I've heard a lot about the, uh, the integration of renewables into the grid. I think that one of the, the main parts that you have to do is actually build the projects and stuff that can be integrated. So, so that's a lot of what, what we do. Um, well, it is what we do. Um, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that basic process, how we go about developing projects, putting them on the grid, um, some of the current challenges we're facing. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, so you yeah, have some of the current challenges that we're facing that, that fan our way to get these projects up, and then uh, a little bit on, on the future outlook, which, which might give me trouble with some of the others on the panel, but, but we'll see. Uh